This week we'll be talking about the specific processes of macroevolution, or in other words, how speciation occurs. The lecture this week will be a bit shorter, and, and I do that intentionally because I want you to have enough time to work on your exam this week. So our objectives are to describe the basic system of classification using the Linnaean taxonomic system <clears throat> to compare and contrast the more traditional classification approach, which we call evolutionary systematics, um, with that of cladistics, to explain how species are defined by biologists and how they originate from prior species, to explain what a fossil is and describe how different kinds of fossils are formed, to summarize the evolutionary history of vertebrates, focusing specifically on mammals, though I will note <clears throat> that we will t uh, stop just short of primates because we will start our discussion of primates next week. And then to compare microevolution or phyletic evolution to macroevolution or speciation and explain both how they are similar and how they differ. <clears throat> and so our system of what we call taxonomic classification helps to explain to us how all life connects, and this includes humans as well as non-human species. Systems of classification are the ways in which scientists organize diversity <clears throat> into categories that indicate evolutionary relationships. And so as we classify organisms according to these taxonomic systems, we are trying to find the things that they share through joint ancestry. When we talk about how humans fit in to this overarching um, system of classification. I mean, we are animals, right? We belong to the kingdom Animalia. We're not plants. We're not protozoans. We're not fungi. We're not bacteria. <clears throat> we belong to the phylum chordata, which means that we have a nerve cord, gill slits at some point in development. Of course, our gill slits are embryonic um, and support along the back, which of course then <coughs> has a subphylum. <clears throat> um, we've got the vertebral column. So chordata is our phylum, but our subphylum is verte uh, includes vertebrates. We are in the class Mammalia. Um, this includes, of course, hair, uh, the birth of live young, <clears throat> and lactation. Um, within mammals, we've got prototheria or our monotremes. We've got metatheria or our marsupials, and then we've got eutheria or our placental mammals. And then below our class, we belong to the order primates, which can be broken up into uh, both strepsirenes and haplorenes. We will discuss primates, of course, in much greater detail starting next week. When we put organisms into increasingly narrow groupings, we help to organize the diversity that we see on Earth. Um, we're also able to make statements about evolutionary and thus genetic relationships. As we move down into our system of uh, taxonomic classification, we um, end up at the lowest level with animals that can potentially, only the animals that can potentially, or well, an animals or other species depending on the kingdom, uh, only those that can potentially interbreed and produce viable offspring. And so this is uh, our species level kind of designation. Taxonomy is the field that establishes the rules of classification, and it was developed by Carolus Linnaeus uh, in the 18th century, and he based his taxonomic identification or taxonomic uh, categories or membership um, based on physical similarity. So he didn't have the wealth of uh, genetic information that we have today, which helps us to put together perhaps a more um, complex and uh, clearly defined um, system of, of categorization, but he was looking at just the observable uh, physical features that species had. Um, and specifically, Carolus Linnaeus offered us a kind of four-tier system. And so he included genus and species, which <clears throat> of course had already been in place from uh, from uh, biologists before him, but he also then added um, uh, order and class. And so um, with the system of taxonomy, for similarities to be useful, they have to represent evolutionary descent. And so we've got this difference between what we call analogies and what we call homologies. Analogies are differences that 
evolve due to shared environmental features. And so we can also call this um, <clears throat> we can also call this uh, convergent evolution or homoplasy is what your, your text refers to it as. Um, analogies, by contrast, are uh, features that are shared that reflect genetic ancestry. So when we think about um, homologies versus analogies, we could think about the grasping thumb that primates have. Um, that grasping thumb evolved due to shared common ancestry because there was a benefit as we uh, saw the initial kind of proto-lemurs, proto-prosimians uh, evolve. There was a, this benefit to having a thumb that could grasp. This became more pronounced as we, uh, as we evolved anthropoids. Um, you know, it's only, it's something that has only evolved once in our entire order. And so we don't see independent evolution of this grasping thumb in prosimians and then kind of re-evolving it in monkeys and then apes and then humans. Um, analogies are best thought of as uh, adaptations to shared environments or similar environments. And so when we think about dorsal fins on sharks, versus uh, dolphins and porpoises, for example. Um, you know, if you're in the water at the beach and you see a gray dorsal fin sticking above the water, you're not go you're going to get out of the water. You're not going to sit there and debate whether it's a shark or a dolphin because, of course, the risk if it were a shark and I, well, the, the risk of shark attacks is actually not that great. Um, you know, given that you practice kind of safe ocean behavior, but you know, you're not going to sit around and, and debate which species it is before you get out of the water. You can do all of those debates later. Um, sometimes we can end up with incredibly large anatomical modifications that don't require very many changes in genetics. And so one example of this, we talked already about these regulatory genes, those that affect when uh, other genes in the genome are switched on and off. And we talk specifically about these homeobox genes, the Hox genes. Um, variation in the Hox genes affects the basic limb plan across most higher taxa. And so it's a very minor genetic change that can result in fins versus arms versus wings. Um, so sometimes these very small changes result in kind of magnified phenotypic effects. And that's particularly true when we're talking Talking about these regulatory genes. And so if we think about the fact that chimps and humans, for example, are 98.6% genetically identical, but we think about the big changes between chimps and humans. I mean, we've got these feet that have a big toe that's in line with the rest of our toes. We have arches. We've got the pelvis rotated forward and up. We've got changing position of the foramen magnum. And then critically, we've got brains that are about four times the size of chimpanzee brains while holding body size constant. We can expect that regulatory genes play a role in that process. And so it may result in only 1.4% genetic difference, but results in dramatic differences in observed phenotypes. There are two different approaches or schools of thought to interpreting evolutionary relationships. One of those is um, evolutionary systematics. The other one of those is uh, cladistics. And so evolutionary systematics is a traditional approach to classification. Um, presumed ancestors and descendants are traced in time by analysis of homologous characteristics. Um, and when we look at the images or, or the ways that we uh, kind of pictorially represent evolutionary relationships, we find that as we're generating an evolutionary tree, a phylogenetic tree, that the, uh, in evolutionary systematics, the length of the branches that we draw are um, indicative of, of kind of the time span or the, that time since divergence. This is one fundamental difference between evolutionary systematics and cladistics. Cladistics is an approach that attempts to make rigorous evolutionary interpretations based on certain kinds of homologous characters. And so it recognizes that not all homologies are equal, um, that some are uh, more useful in determining um, relatedness, determining groupings than others. Uh, and so uh, we're really focusing on what we call derived characteristics. The other thing about drawing a cladogram versus a phylogenetic tree is that the branches don't 
or the length of the branches don't give you any input. And so we're not <clears throat> discussing kind of perceived evolutionary time scale uh, through the way that we diagrammatically map um, cladograms. In recent years, cladistic methodologies have predominated among evolutionary biologists. This includes physical anthropologists. This is of particular interest when we're talking about the divergence between uh, Chimps, gorillas, and, and the hominin line, this is also of particular importance as we talk about the plethora of early hominin species. Both approaches are interested in tracing evolutionary relationships and constructing these classifications that reflect those relationships. Um, both approaches recognize that some characteristics or organisms must be compared using some um, specific features uh, and some characters are more informative than others and so this is really getting at that um, that importance of you know key uh, key derived characteristics that some homologies are more important than others um, it also recognizes that Organisms must be compared, or that uh, both approaches then also uh, focus on homologies. And so homologies are much more useful than uh, analogies in derived evolutionary relationships. Um, when we talk about some of the differences between these two approaches, um, cladistics is more explicitly and rigorously defining the kinds of homologies that yield the most useful results. Uh, and so Ancestral traits are those that are shared or inherited by a group of organisms from a remote ancestor are nowhere near as useful as those that are derived. Um, lineages that share a common ancestor um, are called clades and the characteristics of interest for identifying these clades are derived or modified characteristics. And so here we have a cladogram of these phylogenetic relationships among 10 different familiar kinds of animals across several taxa. Um, so we've got sharks and tuna, we've got frogs, we've got Dimetrodon, who uh, was a more mammal-like uh, reptile. Um, Dimetrodon or mammal-like reptiles gave rise to um, to this entire uh, branch of mammals that includes both humans and whales. We've got then another branch of archaic reptiles um, that are uh, theropods who give rise to modern crocodiles, uh, modern birds, etc. And so, you know, we recognize, I mean, our, our tendency historically, uh, evolutionarily, has been to um, group all dinosaurs together in the same group um, and to uh, you know, recognize them as evolutionary dead ends that don't have any carryover in modern taxa. When uh, cladograms identify that this is actually not the case, that there were early reptiles that were mammal-like reptiles, um, and then, then later reptiles came, uh, these theropods. And so as we look at um, the diversity of reptiles that were present before this extinction event 65 million years ago, we recognize that we have um, both reptiles that gave rise to modern mammals and reptiles that then evolved into modern birds. This brings us to this basic uh, concept of how do we define species. The biological species concept is one that en emphasizes interbreeding versus reproductive isolation. And so interbreeding prevents speciation. Speciation is the process by which a new species evolves from earlier species. Speciation is one of our most basic macroevolutionary concepts. Um, speciation or macroevolutionary events always involve some form of initial isolation. So one of the most common is geographical isolation. Geographical isolation, of course, um, results from the moving um, continental plates, results from um, the, the uh, movement of con the continents farther apart. Uh, it can result from environmental change. It can result from even in a modern context, human involved modifications of the environment. When we've got geographical isolation and we have minimal gene flow, then these normal evolutionary processes by which um, 
by which variation is introduced and maintained in the populations can further separate these populations genetically. And so, of course, we've already talked about the importance of gene flow in maintaining species lines. We've talked about uh, the importance of genetic drift and natural selection as um, as kind of directing the or, or uh, manipulating the direction that uh, evolution takes when we've got prolonged periods of um, of these kind of separate evolutionary processes then we end up we can even end up with things like behavioral isolation behavioral isolation is when there might be changes I think that what the text uses is an example of uh, courtship behaviors that <clears throat> we uh, we we can end up with complex behaviors that impact uh, the likelihood of interbreeding ever happening. And so this this example of behaviors associated with courtship, you know, many birds have kind of ritualized dancing that they do before they reproduce. Um, many um, primates have um, these anatomical differences. Uh, many primates have these um, like sexual swelling patterns and such. And so as we were talking about this very first uh, <clears throat> introduction with uh, the work I've done on Sulawesi, and I mentioned that the hotbed of macaque evolution is Sulawesi, you know, then we've got this system where hybrids, even though genetically, even though kind of this basis of, uh, of viable and fertile offspring holds true that these hybrid females um, never end up uh, having people having other uh, macaques choose them as mates because their swellings just don't look right.